Section 20 of Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jump. Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Icelandic Sorceresses. Tell me, said Katla, a handsome and lively widow, to Gunlaugar, an accomplished and gallant young warrior. Tell me why thou goest so oft to Mafalada. Is it to caress an old woman? Thine own age, Katla, answered the youth inconsiderately, might prevent thy making that of Gerida a subject of reproach. I little deemed, replied the offended matron, that we were on an equality in that particular. But thou, who supposest that Gerida is the sole source of knowledge, mayest find that there are others who equal her in science. It happened in the course of the following winter that Gunlaugar, in company with Otto, the son of Katla, had renewed one of those visits to Gerida with which Katla had upbraided him. "'Thou shalt not depart to-night,' said the sage matron. "'Evil spirits are abroad, and thy bad destiny predominates.' "'We are two in company,' answered Gunlaugar, "'and have therefore nothing to fear.' "'Otto,' replied Gerida, "'will be of no aid to thee. "'But go, since thou wilt go, "'and pay the penalty of thy own rashness.' "'In their way they visited the rival matron, "'and Gunlaugar was invited to remain in her house that night. "'This he declined, and passing forward alone, "'was next morning found lying before the gate of his father, Thorbjorn severely wounded and deprived of his judgment various causes were assigned for this disaster but otto asserting that they had parted in anger that evening from gerida insisted that his companion must have sustained the injury through her sorcery gerida was accordingly cited to the popular assembly and accused of witchcraft but twelve witnesses or compurgators having asserted upon their oath the innocence of the accused party Gerida was honorably freed from the accusation brought against her. Her acquittal did not terminate the rivalry between the two sorceresses, for Gerida belonging to the family of Kilia Khan, and Katla to that of the pontiff Snorro, the animosity which still subsisted between these septs became awakened by the quarrel. It chanced that Thorbjorn, called Digri, or the corpulent, one of the family of Snorro, had some horses which fed in the mountain pastures, near to those of Thorarin, called the Black, the son of the enchantress Gerida. But when autumn arrived, and the horses were to be withdrawn from the mountains and housed for the winter, those of Thorbjorn could nowhere be found, and Otto, the son of Katla, being sent to consult a wizard, brought back a dubious answer, which seemed to indicate that they had been stolen by Thorarin. Thorbjorn, with Otto and a party of armed followers, immediately set forth for Mafalada, the dwelling of Gerida and her son Thorarin. Arrived before the gate, they demanded permission to search for the horses which were missing. This Thorarin refused, alleging that neither was the search demanded duly authorized by law, nor were the proper witnesses cited to be present, nor did Thorbjorn offer any sufficient pledge of security when claiming the exercise of so hazardous a privilege. Thorbjorn replied that as Thorarin declined to permit a search, he must be held as admitting his guilt and constituting for that purpose a temporary court of justice by choosing out six judges, he formally accused the Raren of theft before the gate of his own house. At this the patience of Gerida forsook her. Well, said she to her son the Raren, is it said of thee that thou art more a woman than a man, or thou wouldst not bear these intolerable affronts? The Raren, fired at the reproach, rushed forth with his servants and guests, a skirmish soon disturbed the legal process which had been instituted, and one or two of both parties were wounded and slain before the wife of Thorarin and the female attendants could separate the fray by flinging their mantles over the weapons of the combatants. Thorbjorn and his party retreating, Thorarin proceeded to examine the field of battle. Alas, among the relics of the fight was a bloody hand too slight and fair to belong to any of the combatants. It was that of his wife Ada who had met this misfortune in her attempts to separate the foes. Incensed to the uttermost, the Raren threw aside his constitutional moderation, and mounting on horseback with his allies and followers, pursued the hostile party, and overtook them in a hayfield where they had halted to repose their horses, 
and to exult over the damage they had done to Thorarin. At this moment he assailed them with such fury that he slew Thorbjorn upon the spot, and killed several of his attendants. Although Otto, the son of Katla, escaped free from wounds, having been dressed by his mother in an invulnerable garment. After this action, more blood being shed than usual in an Icelandic engagement, Thorarin returned to Mafalda, and being questioned by his mother concerning the events of the skirmish, he answered in the improvisatory and enigmatical poetry of his age and country. From me the foul reproach be far, with which a female waked the war. From me who shunned not in the fray, through foemen fierce to hew my way, since meat it is, the eagle's brood on the fresh corpse should find their food. Then spared I not in fighting field with stalwart hand my sword to wield, and well may claim at Odin's shrine the praise that waits this deed of mine. To which effusion Gerida answered, Do these verses imply the death of Thorbjorn? And Thorarin, alluding to the legal process which Thorbjorn had instituted against him, resumed his song. Chart bit the sword beneath the hood of him whose zeal the cause pursued, and ruddy flowed the stream of death ere the grim brand resumed the sheath. Now on the buckler of the slain the raven sits, his draught to drain, for gore-drenched is his visage bold that hither came his courts to hold. As the consequence of this slaughter was likely to be a prosecution at the instance of the pontiff Snorro, Thorarin had now recourse to his allies and kindred, of whom the most powerful were Arnkill, his maternal uncle, and Veramond, who readily premised their aid both in the field and in the comitia, or the popular meeting. In spring before which it was to be presumed Snorro would indict Thorin for the slaughter of his kinsmen, Arnkill could not, however, forbear asking his nephew how he had so far lost his usual command of temper. He replied in verse, Till then the master of my mood, men called me gentle, mild, and good, but yon fierce dame's sharp tongue might wake in wintry den the frozen snake. While Thorarin spent the winter with his uncle Arnkill, he received information from his mother Gerida that Otto, son of her old rival Katla, was the person who had cut off the hand of his wife Ada, and that he gloried in the fact. Thorarin and Arnkill determined on instant vengeance, and traveling rapidly surprised the house of Katla. The undismayed sorceress, on hearing them approach, commanded her son to sit close beside her, and when the assailants entered they only beheld Katla, spinning coarse yarn from what seemed a large distaff, with her female domestics seated around her. My son, she said, is absent on a journey, and Thorarin and Arnkill, having searched the house in vain, were obliged to depart with this answer. They had not, however, gone far before the well-known skill of Katla in optical delusion occurred to them and they resolved on a second and stricter search. Upon their return, they found Katla in the outer apartment, who seemed to be shearing the hair of a tame kid, but was in reality cutting the locks of her son Otto. Entering the inner room, they found the large distaff flung carelessly upon a bench. They returned yet a third time, and a third delusion was prepared for them, for Katla had given her son the appearance of a hog, which seemed to grovel upon the heap of ashes. Arnkill now seized and split the distaff which he had at first suspected, upon which Katla tauntingly observed that if their visits had been frequent that evening, they could not be said to be altogether ineffectual, since they had destroyed a distaff. They were accordingly returning completely baffled when Gerida met them and upbraided them with carelessness in searching for their enemy. Return yet again, she said, and I will accompany you. Katla's maidens, still upon the watch, announced to her the return of the hostile party, their number augmented by one who wore a blue mantle. Alas! cried Katla, it is the sorceress Gerida, against whom spells will be of no avail. Immediately rising from the raised bed and boarded seat which she occupied, she concealed Otto beneath it, and covered it with cushions, as before, on which she stretched herself complaining of indisposition. Upon the entrance of the hostile party, Gerida, without speaking a word, flung aside her mantle, took out a piece of sealskin in which she wrapped Katla's head, and commanded that she should be held by some of the attendants, while the others broke open the boarded space, beneath which Otto lay concealed, seized upon him, bound him, and led him away captive with his mother. Next morning, Otto was hanged, and Katla stoned to death, but not until she had confessed that through her sorcery 
she had occasioned the disaster of Gunlaugar, which first led the way to these feuds. End of section 20